Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Charlotte Mason Show. I'm your host, Julie Ross, and we are finishing up book six with the amazing Shay Kemp. Woo! Yay! Kind of sad, also. Kind of sad. Kind of sad. sad. But um, (laughs) thank you, everyone, who has followed along and hung in there and (laughs) listened to these episodes with us. We hope this has been encouraging and insightful and giving you some meat and guidance as you chew your way through Charlotte Mason's original writing. So give yourself a pat on the back to making it this far. (laughs) <laughs> not you everyone give you a prize. <laughs> <laughs> yes we'll send you a gold star there um, you go so today's chapter again is kind of like some extra credit it's very meaty um mm-hmm. so this was actually a series of letters that she wrote to the times she actually wrote these in 1912 so this is before world war one whereas um volume six was written after world war one so it's helpful to kind of have this context like i wish they would have put it at the beginning of the book yes that's a good point Mm -hmm. um because what she does is you know you'll see in here she is really addressing the nation and really talking to the whole country and it is interesting to know that this was written before world war one whereas the rest of the chapter she's really appealing to this the time has come like we cannot keep going this is what happens when you have an uneducated society we have this war we've lost this many people we need to change but she was saying that even before that even happened and um you know volume six like i said was written in 1921 before her death but this is you know 10 plus years or 10 years yeah um before that so she's been kind of working through her programs, working through her philosophy since she wrote Home Education back in like what, 1860 something, 70 something, I don't don't know, a long time ago. Um, But I think, yeah, I think it's just important to kind of have that context here that that the volume six that we just finished reading came out of this desire that she had that this is what the nation needs. I've written these programs, I've sent this throughout the British Empire. It's been used in these homes. I've trained governesses. It's been used in schools. Let's do this country. (laughs) And then all this stuff happens and makes it even more so. And then she writes this volume. So I just want to give that little heads up. Yeah, this is like the magnifying glass chapter that like zooms in and says, these are the problems we have. This has to be taken care of. Like we, and these are the answers. There's a lot of like, here's the problem. Here's the answer. Here's the problem. Here's the answer in these, Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, I, I really love these chapters and I almost think it might even be better to read these first. Like I kind of wish these were in the beginning. Uh Yes. I I I agree. It should be at the beginning. Yes, like if you read these at the beginning, then you would have the summary of everything and then the expansion would be yes. in the rest of the volume, like you're saying, um, that came on later. So lots of great nuggets of wisdom in this um, that she kind of boils down into a more, you can tell she's trying to get a lot of information in, hey, I don't have a full book to write this in. Mm-hmm. Right, I have a yeah. letter to say this in, not an entire book to to pour out my thoughts. Yes, so there's kind of little subheadings, so it's easier if you kind of break those down and kind of go with. Okay, this would have been the letter that she wrote, and then several months later, you know, the next one would have been published. So kind of see her progression here and see it more as that than actual like one whole chapter in a book is helpful. Right. Um, so the first part she talks about is knowledge, and she's saying. We are in a bad way, people. (laughs) So basically, okay, what's the problem here? Okay, so what's the problem with our current state of knowledge? So she goes on to say, you know, it's, um, you know, we're living for these examinations. Um, The individual is becoming less and less important, the mom more and more. And we talked last time too about like the utilitarian theory of education. She's saying, you know, it's not... In this industrialized factory education where everybody's working at the same pace and getting the same exact thing and we're going to turn out this end product and we're all little cogs in the machine so utilitarian you know is you know this is what's good for everybody you know again these children are born persons so she's going back to that so there's this this problem here of just giving everyone kind of this mass education 
Um, she gives an example of aniseed drops, which um, I don't know what those are. Do you, Shay? I looked it up. So aniseed is like, has a licorice flavor. So I, I, like, that was the same flavor. It would be like licorice, okay. like licorice candy. Licorice, which okay. I think is 100% disgusting. So yes, I, would not, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry to all the licorice lovers out there because I think it's gross. But I was thinking I would do nothing for an aniseed drop. But apparently there were children that. <laughs> <laughs> and she's saying, you know, she saw like a poor child in London and they didn't have any food. But they took these aniseed drops to kind of fill their stomach and make them feel hungry, even though their body wasn't actually getting the nourishment. And right. she's saying that their modern, our modern education system is like these drops. It makes a mind seem like it is knowledgeable, but it doesn't actually have true knowledge. She said the aniseed drops we have are Marks Prizes, scholarships, blue ribbons, all stay the stomach of the boy who does not get any knowledge. So she's saying this utilitarian kind of style of education it looks like it's producing a result, but what it's really lacking here is knowledge. Yeah. What so important. You in this first part? Well, I think that's so important to understand is that um, she makes so many points about that. Like if we don't understand the chief object of education, what our goal is, then all these things will look like they are successful. Mm -hmm. But they're not actually successful because we're not actually giving them anything to chew on it's like giving your kid a snack and saying okay they're fine but you know that they're not going to make it to the next meal right you're going to have to do something eventually and the time has run out like we've been giving these children she's talking about we've been giving them these snacks you snack after snack after snack and now the time has come where they really need meals mm -hmm. and another of her food metaphors but i love that she talks about what knowledge actually is yes um, right so that's why she's like, okay, so what are we even talking about here? What, are, what is the aim? What actually is knowledge? Let's define that word before we keep going. And she, <laughs> she kind of sometimes goes in circles, I feel like of what she's saying about it, but yes, yes. it really is an overview of her whole entire philosophy here. Yeah. And I like that she says what it's not, because yes. sometimes I feel like it's easier for us to recognize something that's like a Perfect. big idea by figuring out what the big idea is not. Right. Okay, so, so what is it um, not, Shay? She says it is not instruction, information, scholarship, a well stored memory. Those wait, are wait a things. minute. Isn't that just everything, Shay? <laughs> it's Isn't not instruction, that... information, scholarship, a well stored memory. What do we have left? <laughs> Isn't that everything that we've been working towards for all this? <laughs> yeah. So, but she, I love the, the image she uses. It says it is passed like the light of a torch from mind to mind. And the flame can be kindled at original minds on only thought we know breeds thought. It is as vital thought touches our minds that our ideas are vitalized and out of our ideas comes our conduct of life. She, she tells us what it is not. And then she says, but it is this thing that you will recognize when you see it. Like it's like a flame and it has to be passed from one mind to the next mind. And elsewhere, she talks about in this section how it doesn't need to be chewed up from someone else. Like we don't need to learn about authors. We don't need to learn about books. We need to have the mind of an author meet the mind of a child. Mm -hmm. And I a love that image of the passing of a torch and um, the, the mind to mind concept. So it's a good question to ask yourself as you're looking through the materials that you've selected in your homeschool, what kind of knowledge am I giving? Is it instruction, information, memorization, or is it lighting a flame by putting them in touch with the actual mind, the actual artist, the actual composer, the actual person who actually wrote the book? That's right. Yeah, it's vastly different. So it's a good way to go. You're going to see really clearly right here if what you're doing falls in line with that or not. And there's a lot of materials out there. I'm just going to say it and people can throw tomatoes or whatever that are Charlotte Mason inspired that would yes. fall into the first category of what knowledge is not and not yes. passing mind to mind. They're not actually yes. putting the child in touch with the living ideas in the authors themselves. That's right. And then we get 
so many questions of parents who are using these in quote unquote, you can't see my air quotes, but yeah. these inspired things. And then they're frustrated because their kids are not giving good narrations. Their mm-hmm. days are not full of beauty. Their lessons are not short. And they're like, what this quote unquote Charlotte Mason thing does not work. That's because you are using, you know, instruction, information, scholarship, memory. It must be mind to mind. And it really is a simple way to consider it. Exactly. Like you said, like, is the mind of my child interacting with the mind of an author? the mind of a composer, the mind of an artist by what I'm giving. If not, that may be, I'm going to say probably is why you're frustrated with some of the results that you're getting. Yeah, absolutely. Because she even says that here. She says, um, talking about like, if they have a short list of books, the scholar will not get mind stuff. If the books are not various, his will will not be an all around development. If they are not original, but compiled at second hand, he will find no material in them for his intellectual growth. Again, if they are too easy and too direct, if they tell him straight away what he is to think, he will read, but he will not appropriate. He doesn't have to chew at the ideas and come to understanding of them. If they are too easy, too direct, they're just regurgitated information. There's no mind chewing there. I can read it, okay? But I'm not going to have to do that mental work that my body actually needs in order to grow. And she says, we have a habit of deprecating children. Yes. And again, I think it's so important here because she's just showing how highly she views children and what they're capable of. And she says, um, here are some maxims that should help us. Okay. So like cross stitch these on some pillows for your schoolroom people. (laughs) Do not explain. Do not question. Let one reading of a passage suffice require the pupil to relate the passage he has read there you go that's all you gotta do folks (laughs) really if you had a checklist of that on your wall you know I feel like it would just be I may need to make one like on a big poster (laughs) for myself to remind myself because she says that like you were saying if we talk down to our children and water down their books it is injurious Mm -hmm. it literally is injurious to their curiosity Mm-hmm. And then boom, boom, boom. So simplified. Yes. I love it here too. She she goes through kind of, okay. The teacher must read to know. I mean, I'm sorry, the child must read oh. to know. The teacher's business is to see that he knows. So yes. this is again, this is not complicated, people here. She's like, really, I'm making this very simple. Okay. The child's gonna read to know that your job as the teacher is to see that he knows. Yep. All acts. All the acts of generalization, analysis, comparison, judgment, and so on. The mind performs for itself in this act of knowing. This act of knowing is narration. So, you know, you can give your child a bunch of comprehension questions, which requires absolutely no thinking whatsoever. Like, what color was Johnny's shirt? You know, or you can have them narrate and people are like, oh, that's not enough. They're not doing enough. Really? Because they're generalizing, analyzing, comparison, and judging they're making connections all these higher level thinking skills their minds are doing in this act of knowing it really is simple yes we and like we, to over it we do and we've talked about it over and over again through this entire you know book club but i feel like you can't say it enough because it's so different from the way we were educated and the way the education is done now so Talking about the simplicity of it does not mean that it is simple. No. Just because it is it is a simple process does not mean that it is simple mind work. It's awesome. rich and it's yeah, even saying this. If you doubt this, why don't you try to read a chapter of Jane Austen or the Bible before you go to bed and then narrate it in the morning? If you think this narration stuff is just willy nilly silly, easy stuff, you try it. That's right. Parent, and see how hard it is. Or try to read like a, you know, a book about physics or something. <laughs> Narrate it. It's hard. 
It is. It's hard. And when, you know, my children were smaller and I was trying to really do a lot of modeling of narrating for them, different things, you know, like that were not their lessons, but so that they would see, I'm like, wow, it does give you an appreciation. You really should try it. <laughs> I mean, I really think these moms should try, read something and then try to just read a good living book. Read Charlotte Mason's writings. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. And that's really what we're trying to do in this book club. Yeah. Like we narrate and, and, you know, it works our brains. We're tired when we're done because we've really, really tried to think about what it means and how does it relate to our own lives. And yet as many times as I've read, this is probably the third time I've read this volume. I've gotten more out oh. of it this time. You know why? Because I've had to narrate it. Yep. Mm -hmm. that's and it shows right. you the power of it, right? It's not just saying power. when you're kind of out the other, when you have to teach it, when you have to talk okay. about it, you retain way more. Yes. Yep. You chew on it. And then she goes on talking about her high view of children about, okay, well, let me tell you some of the books that will help them with this knowledge. So when they're seven, they should really Pilgrim's Progress. And then they should also be reading Shakespeare and Plutarch's Lives yes. and things that adults don't read. So again, she has this very, very high view of children. Um, she says that these children will have generous enthusiasms, keen sympathies, a wide outlook and sound judgment because they are treated from the first as beings of large discourse, looking before and after. They are persons of leisure too, with time for hobbies because their work is easily done in the hours of morning school. So not only is she expecting them to chew on such hard material, but because she has these short and various lessons, they're able to get it done in a shorter amount of time and still be children that can have leisure and hobbies and have this wide, generous life as well. And they're not exhausted from, they're, they're interested. We've harnessed the power of the will, the power of reason. We've harnessed the power of curiosity that we've talked about so much in this book. And because we're harnessing those in the lessons and we're varying, like you said, in her schools, you know, you, you wouldn't have, three heavy to narrate lessons back to back because we are, then this is where it all kind of comes together because we're doing that. They're not exhausted after a morning of school. Mm -hmm. We've harnessed the power that is within them instead of browbeating them into lessons that are not interesting. So mm -hmm. then when they come to the afternoon, those ideas are all swirling around their minds, they're swirling around their heads, and they can go. I had a mom today tell me we had a, a, a co Charlotte Mason co-op meeting, and it was so powerful. She's just beginning to trust this process and this philosophy. So she's reading to her seven-year-old Treasure Island. And she said, I thought, I'm just going to read this and we're just going to narrate. And so she's reading it in small bits. Her kids never want her to stop. Ding, 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 which is what we talk <laughs> yeah. about. You know, Leave it with the cliffhanger when the timer goes off. And then she says in the afternoons, they are creating all these things. They drew their own map. They, she's like, I used to make these unit studies where I had to come up with all this stuff. And now I can't believe it, but they're actually making their own maps. They're getting the book out and copying the map in the front of the book themselves and they're playing with these ships in the tub at night this yep. is it works I'm like yes I literally stood up at the table and applauded yay <laughs> it's working I knew it would work I knew you would see it so <laughs> it really does it really does work yeah you, you really do have to trust the process here okay let's go on to part two letters knowledge right. and virtue so in this section she's saying when she's talking about letters, basically what she's talking about is the humanities, subjects that can be taught in a literary form here. And she talks about the power of the classics here, a foundation of great books. And she's saying that out of this knowledge that will come from this great literature, from these letters, is where virtue is going to come from. So this kind of knowledge shapes a person's character. So what stood out to you in this section? Um, I think one of the things is that so important to know where she says there is no better way of knowing a people than to know something of their own words in their own speech. So we don't need to process all this stuff when we're learning about a culture. We can actually put them in context with a, a book about that about that culture. And sometimes we boil geography down to just the maps. Mm -hmm. And this is why it's so important. Like in a gentle feast, I love the way that we read books about that 
area. We're reading books about that culture from those words. And they're actually learning to, to chew on that themselves instead of me saying, okay, these are what the people are like in this area. These are what the people, I don't need to chew that. They can learn about it themselves from their own words, which is not the way I learned geography. My, my daughter's favorite subject is that. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. It's fascinating. It, it wasn't taught in a literary way. Yes. Um, and she gives them my, an example of, you know, a, a public school educated man who um, he doesn't know the history and literature of his country. Um, he has his degree, but then he shuts his books and reads newspapers a little, perhaps a magazine or two. So like you might check on Facebook. But otherwise, <laughs> occupies himself with interest in sports, games, shows, or his employment. And I'm like, yeah. is she living right now? I know. <laughs> is this really written in 1912? <laughs> what? It is so applicable, isn't it? Because that's exactly what we exactly what we see. Right. You know that they they have their lessons and they're done. They don't want any more. They're tired. They had right. stuff shoved in their faces for 12 years, and they're not with school. They don't want any. More. The curiosity has been completely died out from them. She talks in here about grind he at grammar. <laughs> I feel that way about grammar. It is a grind. I have to say. Right. <laughs> hey. oh, I feel you. All right. Was there anything else in this section? Um, I think the last sentence of that entire section was to me the most powerful. The nation is in sore need of wise men. And these must be made out of educated boys. So, and men and women. So we'll insert that there. I know that's what she really meant there. But um, if we want wisdom in our children, we must consider how we're educating them and throwing a bunch of curriculum at a wall to see what sticks is just not doing that. And so she knew that. I think it's really interesting talking about when she wrote this, knowing what some of those men and boys are educated in, what they were going to move into yeah. in the next right. few years. Cause some of these boys she's talking about educating, we knew they, they, we know they went onto the battlefield. Right. 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 And so I, I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah. This third section, then she says she ties knowledge in with reason and rebellion, uh, which is yeah, very yeah. fascinating. Here, so not only does knowledge build virtue, it builds your character. Okay, um, if it's filled with letters, if it's filled with literary, um, poetry, history, um, literature, those kind of subjects, the humanities, the classics, it will shape your virtue and your character. Otherwise. <laughs> you know, you're going to be like she was saying here um, and not have that and just close your books and be done and entertain yourself. Now she's saying that knowledge is also tied to reason and rebellion. Um, I love this. Is it not true that a conviction of irresponsibility characterizes our generation? <laughs> Again, it's like, are you, like, you know, like when are you writing this lady? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And she says, so we, we did a, and we can link to this for those of you who missed this chapter, go back and read the way of reason. Okay. So she has a whole chapter where she's explaining this section, this letter that she wrote for the times here. So it goes, she goes much deeper in the chapter that's in volume six, but she's saying knowledge and reason are not the same thing. Right. We can reason anything our brain wants to reason as true. Mm -hmm. If I believe something, I can find a million reasons why what I believe I is true. You can argue them, right? Um, but that doesn't mean that I have knowledge. Right. She also says, you know, it, again, with the way of the will, the will and reason are tied together. And we talked about those in those chapters um, that, you know, our reason has to be founded on proper knowledge or we will choose to do things that we shouldn't do. Our will will reason that we can do the things that we want to do, not the things that we should do. And that's the way we want our children to, to be led, isn't it? Like we want them to be able to leave us and have that underlying foundation that we don't have to be concerned about the choices. I mean, they're always going to make choices. We don't want, want them to make. That's just the way of the world. But I'm saying <laughs> we understand that they're not just going to be making every choice just because they think it's fine. Mm -hmm. Like they're going to think through these things, use the power of the wheel, use the 
tied with reason, like she talks about, because they've seen it in these literary ways in every single subject. They've looked at people in history who have made these decisions for good and bad, people in geography, people in science um, for good and bad. And then we're putting those tools in their toolbox and they're taking them with them. Yeah, that, that's a powerful thing when you're thinking about kids kids leaving you that you want them to take more than just, okay, I got through 12 years of school and I'm, I'm done now. Um, I love what she says. Without knowledge, reason carries a man into the wilderness and rebellion joins company. So without yeah. the knowledge, we can, again, our reasoning powers are very strong and we can reason anything that we want to. And in today's world, we can find a million other people who will agree with us and back up our reason. And we have this group think, right? Just put a little thing on social media and everybody will think that there you'll find plenty of people to back you up. <laughs> yep. And then she's saying, you know, that this rebellion, this kind of mob mentality will go right along with whatever everybody else is thinking and saying, which we definitely see here. She says that the knowledge that we're greatly lacking that will kind of prevent some of this error in reason is knowledge of God. Yes. Um, and that... I thought this was so interesting. It is possible that church may err in keeping us underfed upon that knowledge, which is life, but she does not send us away empty. Um, you know, we can't get this knowledge. She says we can get a little bit in our little weekly sermons at church here, but we need way more. And this needs to be a part of our daily knowledge that we're getting and um, growing. She says upon admiration and wonder. She talks specifically about the teaching of science mm -hmm. and that science must also be taught in a living way, or it does not inspire admiration and wonder. This is so important. I think it's so important to, to consider this because we think that many times that as she discussed, we discussed in the first part, not science knowledge is just, you know, the information, especially the instruction, the memory when it comes to science, that particular subject, but we've got to find ways. And she mentioned this in many ways here, many different quotes, but we have to find a way for science to ignite the wonder. And the flame of a great scientist, their mind can easily be passed to the flame of a child's mind when we use teach science in this literary way. Mm -hmm. We're studying Thomas Edison this year. And um, I've been amazed at some of the things that my daughter has taken away from this brilliant man, even though I knew the name Thomas Edison, and I've known it my whole life. I never read about him in such a great literary way. And she's taken things away from more than just, OK, well, this is what he made. Mm -hmm. These are the inventions he came up with. Right. It was sparked wonder in her. And we often use that, especially in the older grades, like once we hit that form two you know or form three like seventh eighth grade. okay now it's all just facts mm -hmm. now it's all just the boring textbook stuff yeah <laughs> yep. there's gotta so all that gotta get all that gotta get that in because yeah, that's what real knowledge is right <laughs> but she says it leaves us it leaves us cold and we don't want our kids to be left cold we want them to have that flame that they caught because somebody was interested in the subject enough to dedicate their life to it yeah i think what you said is really important because she's saying in here that science she's talking about in the 18th century like so in the 1700s yes. that science was alive quick with emotion and it found expression in literature yes and then she says the fault is not in science but in our presentation of it by means of facts figures and demonstrations that mean no more to the general audience than the point demonstrated never showing the wonder and magnificent reach of the law unfolding so she says the way that science is commonly taught it's crude it leaves us narrow in judgment it yes. is cold like you're saying um she's saying it's waiting for its literature and so um i think it's really unique the way that um it's kind of set up in a general feast because you have a combination of here's a biography about the scientist mm -hmm. but then also here is the scientific information that that person was researching. So like you were saying in cycle four, they study, or I mean, cycle three. Three, three. Yes. Cycle three they study uh, Thomas Edison, and then they're also learning about electricity. So they're learning about the things that he was working with in the fields that, that he was working with. So it does spur that emotion and that passion and 
have those living ideas that make you have admiration and wonder. So you're not just reading about a person because I've seen that before, which is like a biography that's recommended for a year for science. You right. also have to have the scientific information right, that ties oh, along complete. with it to get the complete package. And there's other ones, you know, like again, with this inspired that really read like a textbook, you know, with some kind of narrative metaphors and wording in it, but really it's really information. That's right. The yes. story, you don't get inspired by the person. You don't get inspired right. by the scientist. Yes. And there's one thing to, I mean, I could give Elizabeth plenty of, this is my form too. I could give her plenty of um, activities to do, but what makes it like the flame is that she's been reading about the person that did these types of experiments. And so she relates to that. Oh, this is the same sorts of things this person did. This mm -hmm. is the same sorts of ways that they found out. So I don't have to have this dry, this is the scientific process lesson. We actually read about somebody who has followed that. Well, look what happened. And then we're going to get to do that thing. And those things hand in hand make science so much more interesting. I mean, it really is like that flame that gets lit. It's just totally different than a textbook. Okay, I got to memorize this. And we always had short answers and fill in the blank in science when I created it. Oh, yeah, me too. So um, different. And talking about just how she is so much should be writing for today. She says, we are losing our sense of any values, accepting money values that our young men no longer see visions and are attracted to a career in proportion as there's money in it. Nothing can come out of nothing. And if we bring up the children of the nation on soared hopes and low ambitions, need we be surprised that every man plays for his own hand? Yep. This is the, this is what happens. Right. We're, they're not inspired. They have soared no. hopes and low ambitions. Hmm. What can I do to make money yep. and not... Yeah change the world <laughs> and not have to chew on anything to get how can i get the most money out of the less effort right mm -hmm. yeah. oh yes and then the last sentence in this section is kind of the whole chapter here knowledge is the basis of national strength the stronger a nation is the more knowledge will have true knowledge not just cool. knowledge that puffs somebody up and looks like knowledge not the knowledge that is devoid of god because that kind of knowledge doesn't Self-righteousness. The reason, right? Yeah. Makes you judgmental. Um, doesn't, it has that group think, you know, problem yeah. with it. And it's also not just knowledge that, um, what was this first section here? Oh, that ignores letters, that ignores the humanities. It's not this utilitarian, what are these just skills you need to get by in life kind of knowledge. The knowledge that shapes a whole person is in the humanities. That's what shapes your virtue. So she's kind of gone through, okay, here's what knowledge is. Here's what's not. Here's what it is. We need knowledge in the humanities. So it'll build virtue and character. We need knowledge of God and of awe and wonder in these sciences, because that will build someone's reasoning ability. Now she's going to kind of give us a little history lesson here on <laughs> new and old conceptions of knowledge. So um, she talks in here about the medieval mind and, um, we can link to this in the show notes as well, the fresco in Florence that she saw that kind of shows how the medieval mind saw knowledge coming down from the Holy Spirit, but working through these learned men at the time, right, of um, who weren't necessarily Christian. So even though the Holy Spirit is the giver of all ideas, she's saying, you know, he worked through Cicero, Aristotle, Euclid, you know, these quote unquote pagan people, right? who God gave them this knowledge and this information. And then this was passed on to the general medieval mind. Mm -hmm. I love the quote that on um, page 323, it says um, that the seven liberal arts were fully under the direct outpouring of the Holy Ghost, but that every fruitful idea, every original conception, be it in geometry or grammar or music, was directly derived from a divine source. And when we learn these things that she's talking about here, these um, seven liberal arts and grammar, music, geometry, when we learn them from living books, then we can grab a hold of those, um, that divine source. 
if we get it in a dry way, then it just feels like another subject in the day. Mm -hmm. And there's such a difference. And I, I mean, when you're connected to, basically she's saying like, we can be connected to God through our lessons. We can be. It doesn't have to be a separation between the sacred and the secular. She talks about that so many times in so many of her writings, that that sort of concept there. But it can be a way to connect with God if we are allowing it to be taught through true knowledge, like you said before, truth and the living ideas. Then, like, okay, I recognize this divine source. I can see it. And our kids recognize it. Yeah, I, I kind of went through the section I, and I found like four points of, because she says, um, supposing that we accept this medieval philosophy tentatively for present relief, what would be our gain? So what would, yes. what would be the gain of believing that, you know, there's this divine teacher that is teaching these things to return? First of all, she says it's a relief. Yep. Then we all get an amen because it's not on me to figure it all out and figure out how to teach everything and present it in a way that's going to grasp my kids' attention and make them love learning and make them retain Entertain them. Like, <laughs> I, yeah. I can sit back and relax and go, I'm putting them in touch with this living source and God is the one instructing. That is a huge, huge, I can't even use a correct yeah. adjective to describe how amazing that is of a relief. If, if there's no other reason to try quote unquote, or go, go into following the philosophy. I think that that is the biggest one is the relief that has put on me as a mom. Absolutely. I do not feel stressed. I do not freak out. I do not feel burdened in any way by the education I'm giving my children, because I know that these living books that I'm giving them connect them to the divine source. Right. And the relief is huge. Yes, I put like a huge asterisk yeah. and I circle that, but it's tar beside that one. And then too, the other gain, like you were saying, that there's no longer divide between sacred and secular. That mm -hmm. great um, practical theoretical knowledge can be sacred, it comes from a beautiful whole, embracing God, man in the universe, the different types of education she was talking about, that knowledge is vital for everyday life, that we need yes. it every day. It's like oxygen. We must have it. And that it is this kind of knowledge that makes someone grow as a person. Um, those were the four things I saw as kind of, these would be the gains. Yes. If mm -hmm. we're adopting these. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and since so we have a, the theory that it does not matter what a children learns, but only how he learns it. So she's talking about how other people are perceiving it, knowledge, which as sound as it is, it does not matter what a child eats, but only that he eats it. So let's feed him sawdust. That's basically talking about reasoning here. You want to follow yeah. that logic here? It doesn't matter what they learn as long as, um, I'm sorry, it doesn't matter what a child learns, but only how he learns it. Well, then it doesn't matter what they eat. So let's just give him sawdust. That's cheaper. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. probably sit in your belly longer <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly right that makes no sense we would never do that that's injurious to a child and she's saying it's the same thing of what we are feeding them if we're not um cooperating with this divine teacher um all right was there anything else in that section um i love the quote that she says um now forceful personalities persons of weight and integrity of decision and sound judgment are what the country is most in need of. And I think like, wow, they didn't even know how much they were going to need that, right? Yeah. And if we propose to bring such persons up for the public service, the gradual inception of knowledge is one condition amongst others. So she's saying this is the end game here of what we want. How do we get that? This is how we get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And then this uh, last section, wait, I think it's, no, it's not the last section. Okay, the second to last section. Education in the fullness of life. Yep. I just love this one. I do too. Yeah. So many what of we're them. really doing here is we're giving our children a full life. Yep. Um, yeah, which is not just knowledge, check a box, go on. We're shaping them as a person that's going to give them a whole life. Um, 
She talks in here about nature study, how that gives you a full life of understanding creation, giving that gives you that awe and wonder. She talks in here about the importance of handicrafts. Um, she says about handicrafts, each shall live his life in that not at his neighbor's expense, because so wonderful is the economy of the world. When a man really lives his life, he benefits his neighbor as well as himself. We all thrive in the well-being of each. <sighs> I mean, I just got goosebumps, like seriously, because when you meet someone who is living their life to the fullest and they are overflowing with enthusiasm for life and for people that they love well, and they have interests in so many different things, it makes you better to be around those people, right? That's the kind of person I want myself to be <laughs> and my children, right? And I feel like I'm more of that. The more that I began to trust the philosophy, you know, we sort of started dipping our tippy toes in it at first because I'm like, oh, I don't know. But the athlete, once you drink the Kool Aid, <laughs> once you drink the Kool Aid, the Kool Aid has been drunk, right? It's just you can't go back. Um, I I feel like I'm definitely much more that person because it's more than just a curriculum choice right mm -hmm. yes it's right. like the, the life, life it's like a life choice it's like a whole life and um she talks about why this education like this matters to society in this section like why does it matter to more than just your family mm -hmm. and i just think that's so so that the next generation bid fair to be provided with many ways of living their lives ways which do not encroach upon the lives of others and the contribution of our generation to the science of education, it is not an unworthy one. And she keeps going on and talking about almost exactly the quote that you gave. But this is important to me because I have married kids who I'm thinking about the next generation now. You know, I'm thinking about my grandkids one day coming. And I'm like, how powerful that my kids got educated this way. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to influence that next generation. That's three whole generations, right? It's influenced me. Mm -hmm. oh, and that's sure. why this education sure makes right a now. difference. Yeah. That's why it matters to more than just your little family sitting around your dining room table. Oh, absolutely. Um, and she talks in here about um, just about the leisure activities that a person has. And before she was talking about like the man who like, you know, reads a little bit of a magazine or two, but like his whole life is consumed with sports games, making money. <laughs> yeah, entertain. But she's saying here, these kind of uh, interests, right? Nature study, handicrafts, music, art, dance, um, that their general joy in well-being is increased. And I love that because these kind of leisure activities bring you joy rather than just mindless entertainment of Netflix or right. Instagram or whatever, they don't increase your joy. And as right. you increase your joy and as you are living your life completely, you're able to do it to the service of others. Like you're saying, it is, this is what is helping the whole entire nation here. It's not just, you know, a bunch of books. <laughs> it's right. this kind of education shapes you as an entire person. And that is going to help us. It's men move the world, but the motives which move men are conveyed by words. I mean, oh, cross this that no. on hello, people. <laughs> men move the world, but the motives which move men are conveyed by words. What words are you filling your children with? Yeah, and I love even the next paragraph. She says, only as he has been and is nourished upon books is a man able to live his life. And she talks about how there's things that we can do in solitude, right? That are mechanical things, but we need to connect with mind for, for, for the, for the knowledge that we need. It, mm -hmm. It's not just, you know, people think, Hey, Charlotte Mason, you're see, maybe you're just I actually had a lady say this today. It just made me picture before I understood the principles that we're all just sitting in our house by ourselves and we're reading books and that's all we're doing. And she said, now I realize that we're just connecting with everything where there's all these connections mm -hmm. and that's why it's so far reaching. It's more than just me. It's more than just my family. It's all the people that we connect with by the way we influence the world because of how much we're enjoying our own lives. That's the thing that gives me goosebumps and makes me say, okay, this is, this is worth doing and me putting my effort into and finding these rich things is because I know it's making a difference in 
their whole lives, not just what we do it for school lessons. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yes. And I hope people see that. And I think once you start doing it for yourself, um, you'll see how much it changes you and it'll allow you to have faith that it's also changing your children, even if you don't always see that fruit right away. Um, One of the things we can put in the show notes as well, Shay, is I have um, a free morning time packet that they can um, sign up for and get if they just want to try that, I think is a great place to start because you're filling, you know, your time with this music and art and handicrafts and nature and things like that. And you can do it quickly in the morning and just see, you know, in 20, 30 minutes a day, how much it actually changes your whole day and your whole outlook on life. It's so amazingly powerful. All right. And then the very last section, she's talking about knowledge in literary form. Um, Again, this letters, as she refers to it here, as the staple of education is no new thing, nor is the suggestion new that to turn a young person into a library is to educate him. That made me laugh. (laughs) (laughs) People go over to my house and they're like, to my kids, like, oh, you guys read all those books? Yeah, I actually had somebody say that today. We had a meeting today and um, one of the ladies had not been here at my house and I literally have books. I mean, you've been here. They're on every surface, pretty much everywhere, all over the place. But I read a lot of books before I was truly educated in the Charlotte Mason manner, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, before just because you read a lot doesn't mean that, that you're necessarily being educated because it depends on what you're what you're reading. Right. And that's what she's saying here. So we need an actual philosophy and we need to, it needs to have order to it. Okay. Okay. Because she says we can go about picking up a maxim here, a motto there, an idea elsewhere and make a patchwork of the whole, which we call our principles. (sighs) And they're done that. (laughs) Yes, That was my whole, and that was my whole, um, attack as a public school teacher that was what we did they just gave us all this well this 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 and this subject this and this there was no overarching understanding of why we are doing things the way we're that doing idea it. sounds good oh oh wait no here's a new one. Oh, that sounds good oh did you go hear that lady oh her yeah. talk was really great now i'm gonna go do that yeah. there's we're blown by the wind of everything and I, we both have been there so there's yeah. no judgment right right <laughs> i you mean I, if yes. that is what you're doing in home educating your children. You are not going to get these results that I've been talking about. That's right. No, you won't. And you have and, to have a principle and a philosophy that has an order to it. Right. And I think the frustration when what usually I see is somebody tries that and they all the new things, all the new things, and then all of a sudden they hit the wall of frustration because they're not getting the results that they thought they were going to get. Mm-hmm. Why don't my kill children, you know, why, why are they giving bad narrations or why is there no interest or all these different things? And so that's why you don't just throw more curriculum at it. You back right. up, you right. consider your philosophy, chew on that, understand it, and then start from there. And that's the way to, to move forward. Mm-hmm. And I love this. Okay. So if I had a soapbox, I'm going to get on it right now. So those of you who are just listening, and those of you watching, I'm not really going on a soapbox, but just visualize me on a soapbox here, okay? Because this word she has here is so, so important. And it just gets you so fired up. She says, we want more life. There mm-hmm. is not enough life for our living. We have no great engrossing interests. We hasten from one engagement to the other and yeah. glance furiously at the clock to see how much time life is getting on. We triumph if a week seems to have passed quickly. Who knows but that the approach of an inevitable end might find us glad to get it all over. We want hope. We busy ourselves excitedly about some object of desire, but the pleasure we get is in effort, not in attainment. Stop just living on autopilot. Yes. If you want to create something in your home, this is how to do it. Wake up. Okay. I'm off my soapbox. This is what she's saying here. You want hope, but you're busily filling your life with all this other stuff that's distracting you from your real purpose and your real vision for what you want in your home. 
That's right. And she, I love, she gives a whole list of things I, I underline here. She says, we want more life. We want hope. We want to be governed. We want a new start. She says in this paragraph, mm -hmm. we're sick of ourselves. You know, <laughs> she's, she names all these things. And then she has said over and over again. So what is the answer to this? What is the answer? Is the answer in uh, a new, another class? Is the answer in another, it's you know, more, more stuff. Let's buy more, more stuff. stuff. That's the answer. Or another, act <laughs> another activity. No, it's not. The, she goes on and she talks about the answer is in these letters or like you're talking about this literary form that we are going to present knowledge. That's how we get the answer to these things. Instead of just like you said, well, let's just keep doing the same old, same old, same old, even though we're not getting a decent result, which is, we know the definition of insanity. <laughs> <laughs> Been there and I'm out. Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And again, she goes back to, if we want to have this change, we cannot neglect the knowledge of God. And we have to turn to that first. And we need to seek an orderly way in which we are living out this philosophy. And so her philosophy is really based on what she says is this divine teaching and what she saw as, you know, the way that Jesus was teaching his disciples and the way that I was saying to educate people. It's such a beautiful, it, it makes it so unique and different than any other educational philosophy out there. It does. It does. Um, and she says, we shall bring up our children as students of divinity and shall purpose our own lifelong studies in the same school. So if you're neglecting your own lifelong studies, right? You're not gonna be able to do this. So first put your own oxygen mask on and you know work on growing your own mind, and then that will pour forth into, you know, as you're changing and growing, your children are changing and growing too. And we're all in the same school here. Yes. We're all together. Yes. <laughs> and it brings so much unity in, you know, I started a couple of years ago. Um, reading books within the same history cycle that my children are reading. Either I would read the, the form four book or maybe a form, form three book or maybe another book that wasn't yeah. in our curriculum, but that I wanted to read. And it's amazing, not just my children watching me, but it's amazing how following the philosophy myself brought life to my whole homeschool. So it wasn't like I was perched up on some um, podium looking down, telling you, this is what you guys should do. It brought us all down to the same level. I'm a learner. You're a learner. You're a learner. You're a learner. I'm a, we're all learners. And so what I started doing was reading that book. We have usually a period at the end of morning time when they would, I would give them some time to read their fable and um, we just set the timer and read. So I would read whatever book I was reading during that time. And so then they had to watch mom narrate what she's reading and share what she's reading just like they do and um it really levels the playing field so that the life is breathed into everybody you know it's all across the board and we're all leveling that and that's what I think she's talking about this lifelong study I'm you know much older than they are <laughs> and yet I'm still a student mm -hmm. and that really does impact kids I think Mm hmm. Yes. And um, I love the ending here. Let's just end on this note. She says, but the country of our love will not stand still. If we let the people sink into the mire of a material education, our doom is sealed. Eyes now living will see us take even the third rate place among the nation. For it is knowledge that exalteth a nation because out of a duly ordered knowledge proceedeth righteousness and prosperity ensue it mm. clear feel deep bear fruit well oh mic drop <laughs> and the book Woo! <laughs> we did it julie but uh, there's nothing else to say after that right there's the that's, it. that's yep. just what She's saying her country needed in 1912, and this is what we need in 2023. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And that's why we've done this is because yes. we really pray that we and all the people that have listened to us over the past year will say, 
um, or more, however, year, <laughs> however long it's been, um, that we all will do that. We'll think clear, feel deep, and we're, we will bear fruit well. I mean, that's what I want my life to look like, right? That's what I want people to say about me and see in my life. And instead of me wondering my whole life, well, how do I do that? Then I have these tools in my hand. I have this understanding of this philosophy that makes me, instead of being frustrated, to have a direction to go in and mm -hmm. and a way to a way to move my family in that direction. That's what that's why we take the time to study these books. Oh, absolutely. Talk so thank you so much, Jay, for walking through uh, this volume with me. Again, like you said, it's been so helpful for me to read it and have to narrate it and teach it. I've grown so much as well. And thank you for everyone who has listened. We hope this has been a blessing for you as you have dived through this. This really giving you a lot of insight into um, just the why behind the philosophy. And then as you kind of order things in your home, they will make a lot more sense of practically living out the philosophy. So um, may all of you be encouraged from this and um you know, if you have friends that you want to read with, I highly recommend that. It definitely helps having a book club with friends to narrate and discuss these concepts with because they are very meaty. So thank you, Shay, for being my friend and journeying this with me. Oh, it's been so much fun. Thank you so much for, for letting me come along. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.